Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Gabriel Herskew. Dr. Gabriel Herskew is a vascular and endovascular surgeon specializing in minimally invasive treatment of arterial and venous disease. He specializes in office-based treatments for varicose veins and other chronic vein disease. Dr. Herskew attended medical school at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine. He obtained his general surgery training at the UC Irvine Medical Center and then a two-year vascular and endovascular surgery fellowship at the University of Southern California Medical Center in Los Angeles. He has dedicated training in vascular ultrasound and is the medical director of the vascular laboratory. Well, good afternoon everyone. So I'm, I'm Gabriel Hershku. I'm a local vascular surgeon and I've been here for a few years with Washington Township Medical Foundation. Today I'm going to talk about varicose veins and chronic venous disease and my goal are that you would understand the basic anatomy and physiology so that the treatments that we talk about afterwards will make sense. That's the whole idea so that this is not some obscure voodoo type of medicine that it all, it all does make scientific sense and, and physical sense. And so hopefully this talk will, will give you that appreciation. And uh, you'll also get to see the various procedures that are commonly performed for treatment of chronic vein disease and varicose veins. So veins are different from arteries. They are part of the arterial, or, or of the circulation of the, of the body, but they are the sort of the counterpart, the yin and the yang compared to the arteries. The arteries get a lot more attention than the veins. The arteries are, uh, carry the blood from the heart to the, to the periphery, to your arms and legs, to all the vital organs, and the veins bring it back. So it's just as important as the, the arteries, but they have different consequences when there are problems with the veins. <coughs> the veins are different than arteries in that they hold a lot more blood. 60 to 80 percent of the total blood volume is in the veins, and they're much lower pressure. So they don't, if you get a cut in a vein, it, it typically is not shooting out blood like, they, like arteries would. It's a slower bleed, although sometimes it can be pretty significant. So if you look at the anatomy of a vein wall, you can see that the, the arterial wall is, has a very muscular character to it. It is able to contract uh, aggressively to change the amount of blood flow and the vein wall has a much thinner wall, muscular part. It can also contract, but it's not quite as strong of a, of a vessel. It's much thinner walled. And the veins can also distend tremendously when they need to accommodate a higher volume. So as I said, the goal is to return the blood flow to the heart. So some basic anatomy is shown here, showing the blood flow in the legs coming up through the femoral and then the iliac veins and finally into the inferior vena cava which empties into the right atrium of the heart and is then pumped in through the right heart circulation to become oxygenated again and then pumped through the left heart circulation to the rest of the body through the arteries. So th the veins have a well-designed system of valves that help bring the blood back up to the heart. And I'll show you a few examples of how that is done in the, in the human body. There's a column of blood that is created 
that must be over that where gravity must be overcome to bring the blood back up to the heart. And so the veins have a system of valves that accomplish that. The arterial and venous circulations basically parallel one another to some degree. There are there's a huge redundancy of veins where there's there's not quite as much redundancy of arteries. But there are deep veins that are the same on either side, with matching the, or they run right next to the arteries. And then there are perforator veins which connect superficial veins to the deep veins. And then there are superficial veins themselves, like the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein, which are also play a part in bringing blood flow back up to the heart and to the central venous system. So the obstacle that the veins have to overcome is gravity. Since we stand upright, when the blood wants to move up towards the heart and it's sitting at the ankle, it has to overcome a column of fluid all the way up to the heart. So there's quite a bit of pressure. And to bring a little physics into this, the pressure at any point at the base of a column of fluid has to do with the density, which is that rho character here the force of gravity and the height of the column. And so when you're laying flat, there's not much pressure that it has to work against. When you're laying down, your veins work, function very well, and they just transmit the blood along a, a, a level surface up to the heart, and your heart can pump it through. But when you stand up, that changes dramatically. There's pressure is created in the veins at the base of that column of blood, and it can be as high as your arterial pressure if there's no other system to counteract that. So the body has an intricate system. This, this one, this slide just shows the pressure that's created at the, at the ankle level by a column of blood due to dynamic and, and hydrostatic forces. So the body uses a system of valves to help hold up that column of, of blood. These are basically one-way valves so that every movement, every heartbeat moves this venous blood across a valve at some point in the circulation and it can't come back down. So this is kind of, for those of you who are familiar with hydraulics, hydraulics are, can lift an incredible amount of force because you're pushing just a small surface area each time and that's, that's what happens. Every little movement pushes just a tiny bit of blood across a valve in a vein and it, then the valves close as the gravity pulls the blood back down and it can't go back. And so you end up with this incredible force moving the blood back up to the heart, which is adequate if all these valves and if everything's working normally, is adequate to bring all the blood back out of your legs so you don't even have any swelling at that in your legs. So on the, the right side here, you can see that there's the height of the column of fluid, which is labeled H, would be if there's no valves. But when there's, if you put a few valves in between here, that calculation of pressure is now correlates to H divided by 4 instead of H, div H over 1. So the pressure is dramatically decreased when the blood is sitting on these valves. So to give you an idea of what these look like, this is a video of a valve. Now this is an ephemeral vein of a cadaver, so this is the main deep vein of the leg. And you can see it, it's a very delicate structure. And right now, this video shows basically water moving through it, but if you can imagine blood moving through it, the valve can move one way and then it closes back the other way. And this, you can see that it's a very, uh, precise structure and, and uh, believe it or not, this structure doesn't leak very easily. It looks like it would break on the spot, but in, in the body it's very robust. Some old drawings of these veins are shown here. As early as the 15 and 1600s, these were described based upon uh, anatomic dissections. I don't know that they knew what they were for at that time, but they certainly made some nice drawings of them. So the deep venous system and the superficial venous system are treated very differently in treatment of vein disease. 
The deep venous system communicates directly with the heart and is the main freeway for, for venous blood flow. That's where the, that, those are the most important channels to bring the blood flow back to the heart. And it, they all feed into the iliac veins in the, in the pelvis, and then finally to the inferior vena cava, which brings it up to the atrium. Deep veins are surrounded by muscle. That's one of their characteristics. That's how we know it's a deep vein. And they contain very robust valves. And that's where the deep venous thrombosis, the dangerous blood clots occur, okay? Those are the ones that can go up to your heart and cause a problem. So that's where, these are the veins inside the muscle that contain those deep venous thrombosis. People get superficial venous thrombosis that is a much less serious condition. The superficial, vi superficial venous system is shown here, and this consists of mainly the great and small saphenous veins. We call these the axial veins because they run all the way down the leg and they're pretty reliably there. And this, these are the veins that are used for bypass procedures, bypass on your heart, or uh, peripheral arterial bypass procedures, as well as a few other types of surgeries, uh, specifically in vascular surgery. There are some other more complex named vessels that are involved here and shown here, but the main two uh, in the superficial system are the small and great saphenous veins. Perforating veins are veins that connect the deep and superficial system. So what I want you to understand is that everything's moving towards the heart. So there's a unidirectional flow. So as the blood comes up from a superficial vein, it can either stay in that superficial vein or it can go through the perforator vein into the deep system. But once it's in the deep system, it doesn't get out again. It goes all the way to the heart and the valves work better in there so it makes it all the way up. So unidirectional flow up and in to get back to the heart. That's the main concept there. The perforating veins are also one-way veins. So one of the main powerhouses for moving the blood flow up to the heart is the musculovenous pump. So your calf is, has this amazing system where it has these high-capacity veins in the calf muscle, in the gastrocnemius muscle and soleus muscle. And it basically works just like the, the heart would work. If when, when, it relax, when you relax the muscle, the veins fill. And then as you tense the muscle, the veins eject that blood out. And it goes into the deep system and is, and is pushed back up to the heart. And so when you're walking, you are pushing that venous blood flow up through those one-way valves back up to the heart with more force than any of the other movements combined. So walking is, is tremendously important in treatment of vein, vein disease. We emphasize it all the time. But this is the main, the main way that your body moves the blood up out of your legs is by walking and tensing your calf muscles. So the picture over here shows the connection of these veins in the, in the gastrocnemius muscle going into the tibial vein, which is a deep vein. And this one shows the connection between great saphenous and the, and the perforator vein. But the main thing is that this is the area where it's ejected out of the muscle using the musculovenous pump. So here's another cartoon showing the way that this musculovenous pump works, where there's unidirectional flow. And you can see when it's at that rest, there's blood flow moving in from, from below and from the perforator veins. When you contract, it pushes it up, and as you release, it fills again. So the, the valves open and the more blood comes into that, those muscle storage veins. So if you measure the blood pressure in the veins as you walk or as you use your calf muscle, this is what you get. As you start, these are calf raises. So this is someone standing and raising their heel off the ground. And each, each part of this sawtooth pattern is one raise of the calf, or run raise of the heel. And so the pressure drops d dramatically from, this is standing still, and this is using your calf, you can bring it all the way down, it's, it's about a fourth of what it started at. And this is typical, your blood pressure in the veins goes way down when you use your calf muscle. 
And this is a normal response. If all the valves and the calf muscle are working correctly, this is what you should see. Now, what happens when the valves don't work correctly? Well, unfortunately, that's the, that's one of the major, that is the major problem with veins and the major cause of vein disease is that many of these valves will become either stuck closed or, or become incompetent where they, the blood can move either way and they, they become a leaky valve or incompetent valve. We also call that venous reflux. So when the valves don't work right, here's what you get. Instead of the big drop in pressure, you get a more modest drop in pressure and a more rapid return to high pressure. So, and you'll find that venous hypertension or venous high blood pressure is the enemy in vein disease. That's the load that the arteries and all the tissues are having to push against to get that blood back to the heart. If you're not doing that, then the blood sits there, what we call venous stasis, and that's the cause of all the problems with vein disease, or most of the problems with vein disease. So the effects on the tissue are, can be quite dramatic. Varicose veins have to do with superficial venous insufficiency most of the time, meaning that the, not the deep veins, but the superficial ones, the saphenous, are usually the culprits. They become high pressure just in those veins. And then the little branches of those veins get dilated and start pushing up on the skin, and they can become quite painful. You can also get some edema from that. But once you start getting these more advanced changes, like swelling, the skin changes, and the ulcers, it usually signals that there's another deeper problem present, more than just the superficial veins. So, but you can see that this, this patient has quite a bit of swelling compared to the other leg. There's darkening of the skin here. And th this is another example of the darkening. We call those hemosiderin deposits. And that's due to blood sitting in the tissues that can't get out. So the arterial and the venous pressure are too close to each other. So the arterial is pumping in at one pressure and the, there's a too much pressure so the blood stays there. There's too much pressure in the outflow. And if that happens to the point where no blood is moving, no oxygen gets delivered to that skin. Well, when no oxygen gets delivered to the skin, the skin dies and you get an ulcer. And that's what this is an example of here. So that's the, the problem. As you see, it's all from venous high blood pressure. If we could decrease that venous high blood pressure, then all the blood would move through, oxygen would be delivered to the tissues, and everything would be healthier. The leg would feel better, the skin would look better, it would all, it would, the ulcers would heal. So venous high blood pressure is really the enemy. So what causes venous damage? Well, there's two main causes of venous damage that, that I see in chronic vein disease. The first is that there can be obstruction of the vein. So certainly if you think about obstruction of the vein, meaning that no blood can get through that vein at all, you're going to have really high pressures when you pump arterial blood in there. It's going to raise it up to arterial pressure. And so obstruction can cause a dramatic venous hypertension and really major problems. That can happen acutely with a deep vein thrombosis, or it can happen years after the blood clot because of damage to the veins that has caused a narrowing of that area. Insufficiency is the problem with the valves, and that can also be related to blood clots because the blood clot itself creates an inflammatory condition and the healing can damage the valves in the leg, in the veins of the leg, causing an insufficiency as well. And sometimes they're both present and you can have dramatic, dramatic synergistic problem. So deep vein thrombosis is a very common entity. It's been uh, it's been identified as one of the major quality measures in hospitals now. There's over 500,000 cases of deep vein thrombosis per year with mortality estimates at 50 to 100,000 people per year. And the reason for mor mortality most of the time is pulmonary embolus where the, the clot in the deep vein breaks free and goes downstream, which is to the heart. And when it gets pumped into the, into the pulmonary circulation, into the lung circulation, it blocks the exchange of oxygen to the, to the, in the blood and can result in death. You also can have limb threat from a 
deep vein thrombosis, resulting in a condition called phlegmasia, and I'll show you something, a picture of that in a moment, where there's, it's blocked the outflow of the veins so dramatically that there's no oxygen getting to the whole leg, and the leg itself can become ischemic or without blood flow and, and die. You, you can get a gangrene from that. And then post-thrombotic syndrome is, is a chronic swelling after deep vein thrombosis or chronic changes in the leg that can cause swelling, skin changes, and disability, and even ulcers. So Rudolf Karl Virchow was a, a German doctor in the 19th century. And he, he was, I don't know if he discovered it, but he coined the Virchow's triad with, for blood clot formation, which is the three things that are necessary for a blood clot to form in a vein. And these are stasis, meaning the blood's not moving. And as I said before, that can be for multiple reasons. Hypercoagulability, if there's something else going on that's causing an inflammatory condition in your body, such as trauma, cancer, an infection, some kind of surgery. The, as you know, the, the rate of blood clots when you have like a hip or knee surgery is very high. And so if you've, if you've had one of those done, you'll see that, they, that the, your orthopedic surgeon will probably put you on some blood thinners as soon as possible after the operation and keep you on for a little while until you're walking again. So that, that kind of trauma from surgery is, causes that inflammatory state. And then the last is that if you have damage inside the vein, it creates a nidus for the clot formation when the inside layer, the endothelial layer of that vein is, is exposed to the blood or when it's, the, it's ripped and there's blood exposure to the vein wall. So here's a picture illustrating pulmonary embolus, a blood clot that has broken free and has gone up into the pulmonary vascular system pumped into the lungs. So this is a picture of phlegmasia cerulea dolens, or literally painful blue swollen leg. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like when the blockage in the veins is so dramatic that there's no exchange of oxygen in the tissues. And you can see the lower leg is turned blue, and there's even gangrene developing on the toes uh, from this condition. And this condition can be life-threatening if it's allowed to proceed and it requires emergency treatment to try and open up those veins to salvage the leg. Otherwise, the leg amputation is necessary. And you can see the, the difference in color compared to the normal leg. There's a huge difference. So when we see this, this is an absolute emergency and we, we treat it immediately by trying to get the veins open again and perfusion started. So this is what we just described. So the way we used to handle that when that, when that happened was a open thrombectomy. Before we had all these fancy toys that we have now, we would do a, a surgical procedure, open up the vein and pull it out, pull the clot out. And this is still sometimes done, depending on the status of the patient. Sometimes this is the only way we can get the clot out and save the leg. And so we do occasionally do this. But the, the picture down here at the bottom shows insertion of a, this is a Fogarty balloon. And you can pull out the blood clot through this venotomy or, or vein incision. And then you do the same thing through the bottom part and clear it out and reestablish the flow. And so to protect from a pulmonary embolus, one way to, to surgically do that is to block the blood flow through the vein in the abdomen. Now if you do that, you are creating venous high blood pressure, but the blood does tend to make its way around and you can usually just have some leg swelling and some disability, but you, you'll survive. So this was the old way that they would do this is to ligate the vena cava in the abdomen and that would protect from further blood clots, but this is not how we do it anymore. So as you can see, this is the anatomy and so if you went right about here and, and tied this vein off, well then the veins would, it would have to go through collateral vessels which are on the abdominal wall or other areas and find its way back up into the heart by another route. So this, this is a graph of what happens with obstruction, just so we can reiterate how, how much pressure there is when you obstruct the vein. And this is part of why we don't do that ligation of the vena cava except for in extraordinary circumstances. 
This is the drop in pressure with an obstruction of the vein. It doesn't go down at all because the blood has nowhere to go when you start pumping the blood in there. In fact, it can even go up higher than, than the pressure that, that you have there. So remember, this is the drop in blood pressure with exercise in normal veins. This is if you have insufficiency of the valves, and this is if you have obstruction. So when a blood clot forms in a vein, in the deep vein specifically, most of the time the human body can adapt to that problem. Most of the time you don't get a phlegmasia with a limb loss scenario and, and life-threatening conditions. Most of the time it just it forms in the vein, you get some swelling of the leg, and then little by little it will recanalize. It'll find another way for the blood to get out of the, of the leg. And that's through not only because of pressure in the veins, but also because of hormonal responses and growth factors and things we don't totally understand, but the, the veins seem to develop and form new pathways up. And so you can see in this picture that there's a blockage of the vein here, and there's actually already collaterals forming here in this, in this photo. But those collaterals are, are not as good as the original system. And so the, the original vein that, that formed this clot that was completely blocking it will eventually recanalize. And so a venogram, if we shoot contrast in and take x-rays, will show that the blood is going back through the vein but the actual vein itself has just small areas that's transmitting blood and it's mostly scar tissue. So this is a, a not very functional vein anymore. It can cause persistent problems with chronic leg swelling, chronic high blood pressure in the veins, and sometimes intervention is even needed for that. So now, nowadays with, with deep vein thrombosis, we are more aggressive than we used to be. It used to be that we just did anticoagulation, but now we've, which is Coumadin or, or some of the newer agents, nowadays we actually go and try and salvage the valves to some degree when the, when the clot forms. So in the, the blood clots that form in the pelvic region and extend down into the legs, we actually do an emergency procedure or an urgent procedure to clear that out using a substance called TPA, which is a, a tissue plasminogen activator, which helps your body break down that clot. The, that's sort of a dangerous medication because it can cause bleeding at other sites. If you're bleeding anywhere else in your body, it's going to break down those clots too. So people with gastrointestinal bleeds or intracranial bleeds or had previous surgeries have a risk for bleeding. So we, we we do that, but it's in select patients who have a, an enormous clot burden, and, and the point of doing it is to salvage the, the function of the valves in those veins so that these long-term conditions don't occur. So virtually all patients will get anticoagulation after, regardless, and that's uh, three to six months minimum. Usually it's Coumadin, but now there are some newer agents. If any of you have heard about these new agents, the, the, the way they advertise them is that you don't need to get lab tests, and that's true. They're Prodaxa, Xarelto, Eliquis, but these, these newer agents are not reversible, and that's the downside. So if you get in a car accident and hit your head, there's nothing that you can do surgically to help you, and that's a big problem. So th they haven't caught on as much as they, the companies had hoped. However, when they do come up with a new agent uh, or a, a reversal agent for those, I think they will be very popular. And so back to the treatment of, of deep vein thrombosis. The pharmacomechanical thrombectomy is the procedure that we do through an endovascular method. In other words, I'm not opening up the vein through a surgical incision, but rather going through a puncture into the vein and treating it from the inside out, almost a roto-rooter of the vein to clear it out. Sometimes we put a vena cava filter, and I'll show you one of those in a moment, that blocks the large clots from going to the heart. It will keep the, the larger ones from making it through. And those are in patients who have either a very high risk for the blood clot going up to their heart, or if they have some reason they can't have anticoagulation in the setting of a lower extremity 
deep vein thrombosis. And then compression therapy is something we, we give everybody for treatment to, to reduce the risk of a post-thrombotic syndrome or chronic changes in the leg, including swelling or skin changes. And this is the description of post-thrombotic syndrome. It is also due to the venous high blood pressure, the venous hypertension, but it's a late finding. And we generally tell people to walk early after a blood clot. We sometimes will keep them in bed initially, but we try to get them up and, and walking using compression stockings to delay the development of this post-thrombotic syndrome. So this is one of the tools that we use for treatment of an acute deep vein thrombosis. This is called ECOS, which is a, a company that makes a catheter. So a catheter is just a tube that delivers a substance into the veins. But this catheter also has an ultrasound element that is able to break down the clot using ultrasonic vibrations. And so, as you can see in this picture, it's, it, the idea is that you give that strong medication, the TPA, through the catheter, so it's bathing the clot in that, that very strong lytic medication. And then the sound waves actually go into it and help break it up. So you have both of those modalities working on the clot at the same time. And this works quite well for treatment of blood clots. Another one we use is this mechanical, we call this pharmacomechanical devices, because they, we, we give TPA and at the same time we can create high pressure jets of fluid inside the clot, so we're, we're emulsifying it in some, in some ways and then also exposing it to that high, that strong medication. And this one uses a special principle called the Venturi principle, where the increased the increased velocity of blood throw th flow through a smaller tube will create a pre pressure differential and creates this circular movement of fluid. And it actually, this, that catheter is actually able to suck out the emulsified clot. The trellis device is another one we use to break up clots. There's two balloons, and in the middle is a sinusoidal wire. And this wire spins and it's like a little blender. You basically have the clot sitting here on the, on, in this area of the vein, so you've, you've isolated it between the two balloons, and then you turn on the blender and you grind it up, and at the same time you expose it to that strong medication. And then you suck it all out, and this syringe takes the, the fluid out at that time. So here is a, a picture of the vena cava filter. So this is to protect against the blood clot going up to the heart. And it's placed in the infrarenal below the kidney arteries inferior vena cava, so right about here. It is delivered through a small tube and then allowed to spring open to its total size. And the diameter of this is up to three centimeters in width. So you can put it in a vena cava, which is up to three centimeters, which is a very big vena cava. Um, and it's placed here in, the, in that part of the vena cava. So there's a picture of, of a vena cava filter in place. This catheter that, that you see coming down is actually the way the contrast is administered. And so it's, sh it's pushed through there and then the x-rays will pick it up as it flows upward through the filter. This is a filter with nothing in it. And this is a filter with a clot sitting in it. So this big clot, this opacity in, in there is a clot that would have gone to the lungs. It would have gone up to the heart and been pumped into the pulmonary circulation, but it was caught by the filter. And it probably saved this patient's life, having it there. Placement of a filter is a very simple procedure, very low risk, and they can be removed later. That's why there's a hook on the top. It's for removal of them later through another procedure. We also use the angioplasty and stents in treatment of vein disease for the same basic purposes. These are pictures of, of treatment of arterial lesions for the most part, where you see the plaque build up in the walls that has narrowed the artery, and then treatment with a balloon, and then better flow through the artery as a result. If they're still narrowing, sometimes stents are placed. In veins, it's similar, but it's usually due to scarring or compression from other structures in the veins, and the scarring may have to do with the previous blood clots. 
or it may be due to some sort of repetitive trauma. So much of what we do for treatment of veins now is in the interventional suite. Same thing with treatment of arteries. Uh, it's almost all done interventionally now, using x-rays and contrast dye and sometimes ultrasound. And so you, instead of being put under general anesthesia with a breathing tube and having a big incision that you have to heal and maybe staying in the hospital for a week, we do it through a puncture. And you're awake the whole time and we talk during the procedure and we say, is that, are you having any pain, Mrs. or so-and-so? Or, you know, you, so it's, it's a very, it's a much more comfortable process. And typically you leave the hospital a lot sooner because you don't have a big incision to heal. You don't have all the complications associated with major surgery. So here's a case study. I have a couple of these I'll show you. This is a 75-year-old female with a history of a, of a deep vein thrombosis in the iliofemoral region, meaning in the pelvis down into the leg, 15 years ago. And she had left leg swelling and discomfort, particularly whenever she would walk. So when we talk about that, the, the, there's a condition called venous intermittent claudication. And all that means is that it's reproducible pain whenever you walk is claudication. And that can be from arterial or venous cause, but it typically has to do with not enough oxygen being delivered to your muscles to support the increased demand of walking. And in the venous state, what it has to do with is the buildup of pressure due to the increased arterial flow and the obstruction stops it from getting out. So the symptoms are a feeling of a bursting pressure in your, in your leg that is, builds as you walk and is relieved by stopping for a minute and builds as you walk and is relieved of stopping a minute. So she had this problem. She also did have some varicose veins and had been evaluated for treatment of those, uh, but interestingly, the veins extended onto the abdominal wall. So what that, what that tells you is that there, those may be the collateral veins going around something that's blocked there at the top of the leg because normally the varicose veins do not extend from the leg onto the abdominal wall. So she had a venogram performed, and the venogram showed that there were just collateral veins, a lot of collateral veins and an obstruction. So what this, what this pattern is, is that all of these veins in here are collaterals. They're huge, tortuous, dilated collaterals. And the blood is trying to move back to the heart, which is up here. And so it's going across the pelvis to try and reach the heart. And this is, the, this is a big collateral going across the pelvis and going into the other, venous, the other leg's venous system to get back up into the vena cava. So she had had a blockage of this vein for 15 years, ever since a blood clot formed in the pelvis or in the leg and pelvis 15 years ago. And she had been dealing with this for some time. Part of the reason that veins get so much less attention is because they don't cause the sudden terrible pain and ischemia that are the, the syndrome that, that arterial lesions cause. They can be ignored for a long time and the leg stays on and it's still viable and you can still live your life. You just have a disability. And so that's what her condition was. So this, I treated this problem by putting a wire across that, pro that area. So you have to try and find that original vein and put a wire across into the central venous system. And then opening it up first with balloons. So this is a balloon being inflated inside the vein. And then another one in a little bit different location. And then finally placing a stent there. And you can see the stent extending. This is the top of the stent and the bottom of the stent is down here. So there's little black markers at the top and bottom of the stent that you'll see. And that's to hold the vein open because it typically doesn't respond as well to to angioplasty or balloon inflations. And so this one, when I, when I finished, there's rapid flow of, of blood through the stent. And so what you'll notice now also is that all those collaterals are gone. Not a single one of them still is there. It's just going through that stent. And the reason for that is that they've all switched directions. So whereas those collaterals were providing the outflow, now the outflow is less resistant, has less resistance going up to the heart and all the collaterals disappeared. So they're depressurized and the blood can get out of the leg quite easily. So I have another one to show you here. This is a 70 year old male 
with a history of abdominal arterial aneurysm repair. So he had some large arterial aneurysms, which of course mean that the artery has grown bigger. And those were repaired already, but he had a chronic right leg swelling and a history uh, a long time ago having a blood clot in his right leg as well. So he had a CT scan performed and one of the areas of the, of the veins went through a narrowing, and I'll have to tell you what this is because it's not that obvious. This is the artery coming from the leg. So this is right near the leg and then it comes up and feeds into the, this is where the aorta, so the blood's actually coming down this way to the leg. The vein has to go through right here. And that's why I include this picture is because there's actually a, a growth on the bony prominence there in the pelvis that is causing a narrowing of the vein at this location. And so he had a venogram performed and as you can see, the blood is, is blocked. And this vein at the top is exactly what you think it is. Uh, the, is a collateral. This is a huge collateral coming across and filling over here. And you can see the, new, the vein reconstitute here. So, so you can see it come across. This is where it should be. And there's a blockage right here. And it may also be due to his aneurysm disease because there is an aneurysm here that was treated and here, so there is com some compression on the vein from that. And so after treatment, you can see the, that there is a placement of a stent here in the vein. The collateral is no longer filling and there's rapid flow of contrast through the stent and into the central venous system. And that case it was one I did today, actually. <laughs> so moving on to varicose veins, 72% of women and 42% of men will experience varicose veins by the time they are in their 60s. That's a lot. Now there's different, there's varying degrees of varicose veins, but that is a very common problem. Not all of them are symptomatic either, but they're present. So the prevalence is highly correlated to age and gender. Women get, women get it a lot more than men. And part of the reason for that is that they have pregnancies. So pregnancies create venous hypertension. That big gravid uterus pushes on the veins, pushes on everything in the pelvis, and creates high venous pressure, leading to broken valves. Sometimes the hormones that are involved in pregnancy may also affect the valves and the way the veins are, are growing, but primarily that pressure pushes on all the, the things in the pelvis and can cause a problem with the veins. And so multiple pregnancies is its own risk factor for development of varicose veins and chronic venous changes. There is a family a hereditary component to vein disease. I often have patients who have a, a strong family history on one side or the other of veins and they'll come in even at young age with, with the same problem. So we don't know exactly what part of the DNA it comes from, but, they, but it's there. Obesity is related, Strand, a standing profession where you spend hours on your feet, of course you're creating high pressure in, in the veins, higher than if you were sitting or, or, or even walking. And then of course a history of a problem with blood clots or other uh, vein issues. And so vein injury has, this is sort of a flow, sh a flow sheet sh showing different ways that you can end up with different problems. And basically the varicose vein sits over here. And so the main concept here is that the venous hypertension from thrombosis, from inherited disorders, from any kind of uh, insufficiency, it all leads to the varicose vein occurrence. So there's quite a history in treatment of, of vein disease and chronic venous insufficiency. In the Irish Papyrus in 1559 BC, they mention, it mentions varicose veins, and there was no recommendation for surgery at that time. Hippocrates, still in the, the third and fourth century BC, said in the case of an ulcer, it is not expedient to stand, more especially if the ulcer is situated in the leg. The sore is frequently wiped with a sponge and a dry piece of clean cloth applied. Ulcers which are foul will not heal. So he, they, even, they knew then that standing had something to do with, with these ulcers getting worse and that elevation would help them heal. 
and that the infectious uh, complications stop ulcers from healing as well. In the Dark Ages, evil humors were, were the, the prevalent theory in medical uh, circles. Varices were thought to originate by the weight of stagnant blood on the veins. They were thought, it was thought dangerous to heal leg ulcers because that would trap those dangerous things inside. So leg ulcers in old people, or this is a, a quote, leg ulcers in old people should be left alone and if healed, should be open to drain for humors that, if not drained, may produce serious illness. And then another one, the legs when wounded are very perilous because unto them runneth a great quantity of humors. So people saw that there was a, there was a problem with uh, containing infection, which is true. If you have an infected ulcer or infection in your leg and you cover it up and close it up, you will get very sick. And they, I think they saw that. But leg ulcers were thought to have to do with these humors that needed to be drained and left open. And so people had these chronic ulcers. This is a sort of a timeline here for venous physiology. The description of veins and valves by a French anatomist, Charles Estienne. I don't know how to say and uh, <clears throat> a Spanish anatomist with description of the function of valves. And then William Harvey was the first, made the first description of the true anatomy and function of the venous circulation in 1628. And so this, these are some of the pictures of the function of valves. And if you've ever done that, evaluated your, your, the valves on your arm, you can show that the valves are working by compressing one side and you'll see that the blood can move one way but not the other by uh, pushing on the vein on either side of a, of a functional valve. And so these are from William Harvey who described the anatomy. This is an old votive offering from a grateful Greek patient to his doctor commemorating a successful treatment of a varicose vein. So in treatment of, an evaluation of treatment of vein disease, what do we do? The first thing we do is a careful history and physical examination. You can tell most of the problem from just interviewing someone and, and a careful examination. The, the vein symptoms are very specific to vein disease. So they typically involve pain with prolonged standing and relieved with walking. So if there's insufficiency that says that that type of disease is relieved when you start walking. Remember the, the, the float that uh, venous ambulatory venous pressure picture that I showed you where the sawtooth pattern shows the, the pressure going down. So it feels better when the pressure is low. So those people who have insufficiency will have the pressure drop as they walk. And if they stand still, it becomes very uncomfortable. So they kind of begin this constant movement to decrease the pressure. Now that's different from the, the intermittent claudication that I described earlier where the pressure builds. That's from an obstruction. But after the history and physical examination, and to confirm the suspicions that I have, I'll, I'll order some non-invasive studies, and we call those level two studies. Most of the patients will have some sort of ultrasound examination to look at the function of the valves, and there's manipulation tests that we can do to see if the valves are functioning right, and if the blood's moving in the wrong direction, we can tell. Plethysmography has to do with estimations of the, the size of the limb, and so that, that's a more complex study, but basically the size of the limb and how it changes with, with either elevation of the leg or with muscle movement of the calf muscle. And then there's CT scan and MRI, which are axial studies, meaning that they're, they create an images of, as if we had slices through the patient. And often those can give us very good anatomic uh, descriptions of the path of veins and, and, where, and whether or not there's some sort of compression or other process, primarily in the abdomen. And then the level three studies involve what I showed you, which is an invasive study. And that means we puncture the vein, actually see the blood, dynamic study, see the blood, where it's going and how it's getting there. And if it's moving through the wrong, the wrong direction or going through collaterals, that's, that gives me an idea of where the problem lies. And often with those studies, I can fix the problem at the same time. So here, here's a list of the symptoms and history elements that are common. 
for varicose veins in particular, for venous insufficiency, there will be aching of the legs, heaviness and tension in the legs, a feeling of swelling in the legs, tiredness, e easily fatigued legs, restless legs. As I said, you always want to move them because the pressure builds when you don't move them. And sometimes that's at night too, people with restless legs, although there are other reasons for restless legs at night. Nocturnal cramps and itching of the skin. So why does the skin itch? Why does it become dry? It's because it's not getting enough oxygen. So it's your body's reaction to the hypoxia, or low oxygen, because the blood's sitting there and it's not being pushed across the capillaries and not delivering oxygen to the skin. And so it begins to itch and become dry. And, you then, and that can even lead to the ulcer formation. Many of these patients will have previous surgeries that are somehow implicated in the creation of the problem and the etiology. So, you know, I had a patient recently who told me that they have had a complication from an abdominal surgery and required five more surgeries. And the doctor told him, your legs won't be the same. So there was some, there's all these clues that come in. And I don't always know all the details, but they often do give, give me a direction to find the real problem and what's causing that, that patient's problem. Some patients will have major car accidents where they've broken their pelvis or where they have a long limb, uh, a long bone fracture people who had central lines placed. So central lines go in veins. Those are the ones that are in the neck or the groin areas that are placed usually for, for urgent or, or intense care, intensive care in the hospital, and sometimes for trauma. And those can damage the valves, or the damage the veins to the point where the, they can have a later problem. And it can even be years later. I'll ask patients about their visits to the emergency room and what they're for if they've had a history of previous blood clots, any family history of pe people on blood thinners. Now there are inherited problems with the blood that can make you more likely to form blood clots. So if everyone on your mother's side has had, you know, has, has had deep vein thrombosis or been on blood thinners, or that's a major clue that you might have that gene that predisposes you. And there's, there's a whole list of tests that we order for people like that to see if they have that genetic abnormality. And some people need to be on blood thinners their whole life, you know, but it's better than the alternative, which is potentially a fatal clot. And then I also will talk to people about their functional status. Many of these, these conditions do not need treatment. You know, I'll, tell, I'll ask someone, well, do your legs hurt? A little bit. Well, does it stop you from doing anything? Nope. You do everything you want to do, I do everything I want to do. Any problems at all? No. It just hurts a little bit. And they don't want anything done. And there's no reason to necessarily have something done. So, if they, and certainly if they're asymptomatic varicose veins, you don't have to do anything. Yeah, there has to be a reason to have a procedure. We don't just do procedures because we found the veins. Otherwise, 72% of people would need a procedure from, from me, which would be good in some ways, but it's not the right thing to do for patients. So, yeah, you certainly, I, I, I ask people, what kind of problem are these, is this causing you? And that's when we, that's how we decide to treat. Here are some physical exam findings all the way from spider veins. Spider veins are, are by definition, the ones in the, in the dermis, so they're very visible. They're right underneath the epidermis, so you can see them quite visibly, these little tiny tortuous veins. The ones that are a bit lower that you can see through the skin are called reticular veins, and those are considered up to three millimeter veins at that level. And then when they start to protrude out, those are considered varicosities. And then you can see that going in order of severity, uh, actually, this is probably less severe. There's this. Is, well, no, this is darkening of the skin. Here's another darkening. This is also a condition called lipodermatosclerosis, which is a hardening and, and it's a chronic scarring of the skin because it hasn't had enough oxygen for a long time. And so that, this is a condition of lipodermatosclerosis. And then this is a healed ulcer. You can see the area where it was open, now it's healed. Typically those are healed with compression therapy. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And here's an active ulcer, and that's a severe venous stasis ulcer, but that whole area of the leg is, doesn't get enough oxygen. And so it's in this chronic condition, and this can last for years. I've seen patients who have had this problem for up to 20 years, and they've been dealing with it, and it leaks a huge amount of fluid. The, some of the patients that I've seen with this problem have 
not been able to afford the fancy absorbent dressings and I tell them put a diaper on it put something on it because they have to have something and they do they deal with this as a major disability for years and years and years uh, they just wrap up their leg and try and keep some sort of compression on it and, and deal with it but sometimes there's things that we can do about it as I described earlier so the ultrasound that we do well it uses the Doppler effect and if you anyone who's heard a train go by knows that the, the frequency of the sound changes as it goes by or a race car goes by. So you hear this, you know, it starts a little higher and goes a little lower. And so we found that there, there's a, a device that can measure th the movement of anything within its, within its uh, short distance. And so the Doppler uses a piezoelectric crystal which emits a frequency and then it bounces it off of the moving red blood cells. And then as they go by, they kind of make that sound, but we don't hear it. And then it reflected sound comes back and is, it, it vibrates the crystal and it's, it's changed into an electronic signal. And then that is measured on a machine. If you take all those different points and you, uh, and you measured a whole bunch of times all at once, you can actually map it out, the things that you're looking at, and make a picture out of it. But um, and I need, I need a, a volunteer with some short sleeves. Anyone here have short sleeves? I'll show you a little bit about what I mean. Anybody want to come? You can come over here. So just come, come over here for a minute. But you can actually, you can hear the movement of, of blood. And if you've ever heard a fetal uh, ultrasound, you'll know that you can, you can hear the sound of the, the baby's heart. Uh, you know, it makes a, it makes a sound. And so that's the same. So that's the same kind of thing we do with ultrasound. So what's your name? Diane. Oh, nice to meet you, Diane. Um, so I'm going to look at Diane's arm, and I'll show you that the the veins and the arteries have their own sounds, and it's based upon the movement of blood in the. Vein. I'm going to put some of this stuff. I may also need a napkin or something if someone can get me that. So. This is just some goo because it doesn't transmit through air. But this is the location of the radial artery in your arm. All right, so you'll hear when I put this uh, on the artery. I don't know how well you can hear it. This with one hand. It's going to get feedback if I'm not careful. So you hear that, that's the artery. And then if you, that other sound, that comes down, I'll put it on. So if I, if I find an area where there's just a vein, and then I squeeze the arm, that sound, I can put it next to that. Oh, sorry. That's the, that's the venous blood moving through the vein when I squeeze it. So it's a sudden rush of blood. And so uh, when we, if the blood is moving the wrong direction, we'll hear it then go the opposite direction. And we can actually visualize that with the, with the um, duplex ultrasound, which makes an image and shows the vein. Thank you, Diane. So this is the picture we'll get. And you can see here, this is a, a picture of the, blood flow extending after, a, after a, an impulse, like a squeeze of the arm. And so we'll, we'll be able to measure and see the direction of blood flow. And, the, and then with the actual imaging modality, I can actually see whether the vein is open or has blood clot in there. The MRI you know, shows the vein also. This is the vena cava here in the center. And there's a big blood clot sitting in the center. And that's what the, that other arrow is pointing to. CT scan can also show the veins quite well. This is the pulmonary artery here. So this, this is the, on the right side of the heart, it's pumped to the lungs, the blood is pumped to the lungs for reoxygenation through the pulmonary artery. And this uh, opacity inside here is blood clot sitting in the pulmonary artery. So this person had a pulmonary embolus. So, and then of course, venography, which is what I showed you before, showing the the movement of blood through the veins 
in real time using x-rays. And that allows simultaneous treatment of the disease. Another modality that I use is ultrasound within the vessel. So this is called intravascular ultrasound. It's a catheter shown here that's inserted into the vessel and I can see a 360 degree view of the, of the vessel around me. It's still just a slice, but I can move it up and down and see the vessel in real time as it opens and closes and responds to the blood flow. So what I'm sh showing here, this is the vena cava and this is a renal artery going next to the vena cava. And then this is, they're showing a small vein I guess it might be a renal vein coming off there, but the, they're showing the inside of the vena cava. So you can see if most of it's blocked or if there's a, a narrowing, you'll see the walls suddenly come in around the catheter on the screen and then go back out, and that's a narrowing in the vein. So this one is very useful, and I use that one all the time. So as far as treatment, there's been methods for treatment for a long time. Even back in 7th century, there's a vein hook technique that's been described where the veins were ligated above and below and then the, the varicosities from in the middle removed using a hook. And it's not, not that different from what we do now. We do phlebectomy, and I'll show you in a moment that, what that technique is, but we actually remove veins through small incisions as an outpatient procedure. In the uh, Middle Ages, Richard Wiseman is credited with this drawing of a stocking that is laced up to provide compression on the lower leg. It was created to trap the humors, as we talked about earlier, and was considered sort of a palliative treatment. But interestingly, this is similar to a current method of therapy called circade boot, which is a compression stocking that's laced up or Velcroed together to provide compression when you walk. So another quote from 1797, when we consider how filthy the habits of many persons are who often leave their feet unwashed for weeks and months together, it cannot be wondered that skin so neglected should end the decline of life possess a very imperfect vitality. Daily washing the lower limbs with a piece of flannel and yellow soap and water is one of the best means of reviving their delayed powers. And finally, the limbs should be well and evenly bandaged from the toes to the knee observing that the bandage is to be applied most tightly below and more loosely by degrees as it ascends. Now that's from 1797, and that is still the only way we know to heal leg ulcers. <laughs> so they had it figured out then, it's still the only method there is. Everything else is, uh, is an adjunctive procedure but we still use compression therapy and, we, and in our wound center that we run here at Washington Hospital, if you present with a venous stasis ulcer, you will have your leg wrapped exactly like that, from the toes to the knee, more tightly at the bottom and less as you go up. And that is the treatment. And what does that do? That creates, that augments that pump in your calf so that every time you take a step, your muscle, which wants to contract and then get bigger, pushes against a rigid surface. That rigid surface doesn't give because it's a tight wrap. So it squeezes those, those areas, those little lakes of, of venous blood that are within the muscle that I described at the beginning. It squeezes them all the way closed and pushes all that blood up, decreasing the venous pressure much more effectively than any other method that we know of, crea of, of with these little treatments that we do. That is the best method overall is compression. So treatment options involve primarily compression, as I said. There's also pharmacologic or medical treatments with medicine. Wound and skin care treatments, and then there's interventional management. And I've shown you a number of the interventional things already. So this is a typical wrap for the legs. This is called an una boot, which provides several layers of wrap uh, around the, of a rigid compression around the leg. And then on the skin, a zinc skin protection surface. This was invented quite a while ago by Dr. Una, 1850 to 1929, and it's still in use. We still use it, it's been trademarked, of course. Compression therapy, I talked a little bit about this, but it's actually very effective at healing wounds and compliance with a 30 to 40 millimeter compression wrap 
will be effective in healing ulcers and preventing recurrence. 93% of patients with ulcers, with venous stasis ulcers, will heal at a mean of five months. So it, it's the treatment for venous ulcers. And then pharmacologic therapy has not really caught on in the United States, and more so in Europe. There are four different classes of drugs for chronic venous disease. They have venoactive properties, but they've been sort of grouped with the naturopathic remedies, the vitamins and other medical things that are not really tested. And so they haven't been well studied, but there are certainly benefits to these medications. Horse chestnut seed extract has been, been found to be effective as an adjunct for ulcer healing, of course, combined with compression therapy. And anecdotally, I have a patient who's been, had very good results with horse chestnut seed extract without compression. So there may be something, that, something to that. I haven't had enough experience with it to say, and it's not really approved for use in the United States as a, as a prescription medication. It's, it's a... Um, but it's used quite a bit in Europe. The mechanisms of these medications are largely unknown, and it turns out that aspirin and pentoxifiline, which have been touted as having some beneficial properties, uh, don't have much of a benefit in, in our studies. So here's another uh, adjunctive agent. This one's called aplograph. You can... Oh, well, there are... There are Aplograph is the one shown here in the picture, which is basically a, it's a uh, manufactured skin. So they, they took a layer of cow collagen and then put human fiber baths uh, and then keratinocyte stem cells on top. And if you look at this picture at the bottom, this is the aplograph and this is regular skin. So they basically made something that looks like human skin to cover a wound with. Well, it doesn't turn into your skin, but it creates an anti-inflammatory bandage. So it's like a really, really good Band-Aid. <laughs> it's a very expensive Band-Aid too, about $1,500 per application, and that can help to heal venous stasis ulcers, and it's been shown to be effective, along with compression therapy, of course, for healing venous stasis ulcers. We also have absorbent dressings and antibacterial agents that can be put on the wound if that is what's contributing to the problem. And then skin graft, your own skin, which is usually just the top layer of your skin done as a surgical procedure and moved down onto the wound, is very effective as long as the other problems with the venous outflow have been corrected. If there's an obstruction, you don't have much success in anything you do. So the healing of the wound, yes, it's due to com it, you have to use compression, but you have to evaluate all these other aspects as well if you really want to heal the wound and not have it recur. So this is a picture of an, an old wound, an ulcer for over 20 years that was successfully healed using aplograph at about 10 months' time. Of course, compression therapy was also used. So in Treatment of varicose veins, the theory is to relieve any obstructive component as the first move, okay? So if you have an obstructive component based on all those other modalities that I showed where you, you do a thorough history and physical, you do an ultrasound, you, if you have any evidence of an obstruction that has to be completed uh, or uh, evaluated and treated before you'll have success treating the varicose veins. Many of the patients that come to me who have had varicose vein procedures and say their legs still hurt, have not had the, the obstructive component treated. The varicose veins have turned out to be collaterals because there was an obstruction. And so when you take out those collaterals, the leg doesn't get better, it gets worse. So that's a common problem when, when, uh, because we're so quick to treat the superficial veins and take out the varicosities. We, some, some practitioners do not think about the outflow and whether or not it's actually a functional venous system before doing that. And so you get a worse result when you do that. So that the idea when we do treat the, the varicose veins is to take them out, take the blood from the bad veins and put it in the good veins. The good veins are going to transmit the, the blood up, the valves work, so they won't, the pressure will never go very high in the good veins because the valves are there. The bad veins, on the other hand, develop a very high pressure in the lower areas, in the distal areas. 
because they, the valves don't work and you have this column of blood. So we try to close those veins or remove them. And the blood then is forced to go through the other veins to get there. Now you'd say, well, don't you, don't you need that vein? I mean, isn't that an important vein? The deep veins are. The superficial veins are redundant. So they can be completely removed and there's plenty of other veins in the, in the area that will handle the, the blood flow out of that area. And you'd think that, oh, well, if we take out the, that bad vein, we're going to have an obstructive component. That's not the case. That bad vein is causing a high pressure. It's not, it's not really doing any good at all. And so that ends up being the way, the, the way to effectively treat varicose veins is to get rid of the incompetent vein. And then the blood goes through the, the other veins and into the deep system and gets back up to the heart effectively. And sometimes we do some of the treatment for aesthetic reasons, for cosmetic reasons, to remove the unsightly vein or to, because of concerns for skin changes and things like that. So ligation and stripping is the classic way of treating varicose veins. This is now not the standard of care anymore, but it has been for many, many years. And basically, the, most of the time, the varicose veins are related to incompetent valves in the great or small saphenous veins. And so the vein stripping typically refers to removal of the great saphenous vein surgically. So the way we do that is make an incision at the top of the leg and at the bottom of the leg where the vein, they show it here, where the vein continues. This vein goes all the way down onto the foot. So we'll make two incisions and then pass a stripper tool through the vein and out and then pull it out here. Make another hole in the vein and pull it out. And then the vein is forcefully ripped like you're starting a lawnmower from the leg. So it has to, this is a, it would be extra, extraordinarily painful if you had it done without anesthesia. It's done under general anesthesia. There's a considerable amount of bleeding when it's done and pressure is held until it stops bleeding and then, and then the incisions are closed and, and that's the end of the procedure. What it does is it rips all the, the source of all those varicosities is gone. So all those varicose veins that are there clot off and heal and, and they go away. But it's, it's a difficult process. It takes a couple of weeks to get over this surgery. You typically have to take some time off of work or are or, or, or not quite as mobile as you usually are. So it's, it's a big deal to get through. But that has been the standard of care for many years until about the year 2000. This is the, de the device that's used with the stripper heads so that you can see the wire is, is passed through the, through the vein and then a stripper head is applied on the end and then it's forcefully retracted using the handle to pull it out. And the vein actually, the whole vein comes out of the body. Sclerosin injection is a Another treatment that we do for closure of these veins, this is a chemical closure of a vein. So there's an injection through a needle into the vein and the, the vein inner lining is damaged, causing clots to form in that vein and the vein scars down and turns into a piece of scar tissue. So this is minimally invasive and it's fairly effective. It's about two thirds of the time it effectively wipes out that vein for good. But it can often be a useful adjunct in treatment of different types of veins. And sometimes we have to make a foam solution for some of the larger veins so that it, it contacts, the solution will contact the entire inner lining of the vein. There are lasers that you can use on the skin for some of the smaller veins, but we also do these injections into the small veins. Even less than one millimeter veins can be injected with this sclerosin. And often it's like a tree. So you inject one vein that goes into all the branches and closes them all off. So spider veins can be treated as a cosmetic procedure through this small, it's a 30 gauge needle, very thin needle, it's like a hair. But it's, in, it's inserted into the vein and inject this, this solution and it will close off. And within a few weeks, the color begins to change to the normal skin color rather than the dark spider vein pigmentation. The lasers can also be used by uh, damaging the veins using a, a, uh, it's a, it's a mechanical damage to the veins. And then phlebectomy is removal of the veins through small surgical incisions. 
So this is something we do in the operating room or in the office under local anesthetic. And the veins can be, the varicosities can be pulled out. Sometimes this is just cosmetic and sometimes it actually has something to do with stopping the blood flow through damaged veins or incompetent veins. And so it's used as an adjunct to the other procedures. Endovenous ablation has become the standard of care instead of vein stripping. And so this procedure is able to close the saphenous vein without ripping it out, and without removing it, it's closed. And it's closed from the inside out. So a, a catheter is inserted through a puncture in the leg and passed all the way up to the top of the vein. This is an already treated area. And heat is used. This goes up to about 120 degrees Celsius. So that's over boiling. That's a really hot catheter. And so we numb up all the, around the vein with a special fluid we call tumescent anesthesia, which is a numbing, it's a lidocaine and epinephrine fluid that surrounds the vein and causes it to be in contact with the catheter. And then the catheter is heated up and, and damages the inside of the vein, causing the collagen in the vein wall to swell tremendously. And it closes off the vein. And you can see the result immediately after the procedure using ultrasound that the vein is closed. And this is about 95% effective in, in, closing, in solving the problem of that vein's insufficiency and the varicosities associated with it. So it's done in the office setting under local anesthetic and with tumescent anesthesia. And you can see the ultrasound in the background here that is used for guidance of the catheter into the vein and uh, to make sure that we're treating the area we want to treat. All of these procedures are planned using ultrasound first. So we know what the anatomy is and where the problem is, and it's a targeted procedure. So we know exactly where to go and, and what area to treat to accomplish what we're trying to do. So this is a little video of the procedure showing a catheter inside the great saphenous vein. This catheter, the ablation catheter is then passed up and used to heat the vein and it will swell and close and then we treat the next segment down. So seven centimeter segments are treated uh, with a little bit of overlap on each one. And this, this procedure is tolerated quite well. There, the, it's uncomfortable to have that fluid put in your leg but uh, it's nice not to feel the heat uh, from the catheter. So. Uh, it is tolerated quite well and, and there's n usually no pain medication other than the anesthetic uh, injection necessary. This can be done in about 45 minutes in the clinic office and uh, you know the people say they do it on their lunch break you know and you can go right back to your normal activities there's no downtime with this procedure. You go, people go right back to work I tell people to go to the mall and walk around um, they don't have any trouble doing that after this procedure. So uh, it's a very popular alternative to the vein stripping. It's hard to sell the vein stripping nowadays. Nobody wants a vein ripped out of their leg if they don't have to. So here's a, a patient with the veins, a typical patient with varicose veins. That's before their treatment and that's after. It's a good result, right? No, there's, you, you will get improvement. You will get improvement in the legs after treatment. The, the, a lot of times the varicosities become depressurized. So you can see that the, the varicosities along this leg are visible when she was standing. And in this picture, they're not visible anymore. Well, what's the reason? They're low pressure now. They're still open, but they're low pressure. So we've decreased the pressure in the venous system, that venous hypertension. So I can tell you her leg is going to feel better after that procedure also. So it, it, it revitalizes the leg. This is a patient that had an endovenous ablation procedure along with a phlebectomy. So those, the marks on the leg here are marked varicose veins and they're removed through these small punctures. So you can see the little punctures here. Those are all the phlebectomy sites, and eventually they're, they're no longer red. This is a short time after the procedure, but you can see that the leg is flat. Those varicose veins have disappeared. 
which is the goal. So there's a cosmetic and a functional benefit to treating and this adjunctive type of procedure where you use the two modalities, both the ablation and removal of the, of the large varicosities is very popular. So some other things I want to mention as we near the end here is venous valve surgery. So if, there, if the valves are so important, why can't we replace them? And if I knew how to replace them uh, in an effective way, I'd be rich because there's so many people that need this surgery done. When they have valves, many people have valves in the deep system that have been damaged by a deep venous thrombosis or other problem like we mentioned, the trauma or, or whatever procedure. But the, we don't have a good way of making a new valve for a patient. And there are a number of patients with these chronic ulcers that have no other way to heal. And so we, we put compression on them and they heal some of their ulcer and then more of it recurs and they compression again and they just go through this endless cycle. If we could put in a new valve that would work, they would probably stay healed permanently. And so there are several different methods that have been tried and none of them are very good. Kistner in 1968 developed a, a vein surgery that became popular for a while, but apparently he was the only one that could make it work. And so it didn't catch on, but it involved opening the vein and tightening the valve up. So if you remember that loose floppy valve that you saw in the first picture in the video, if there were a way to tighten that and make it a little more robust, that would be great. And so he tried that and he had some success, but not enough for it to catch on or become commonplace. And there's an external one you can do as well, where you don't have to open up the, the vein, you just tighten up the area of the valve. And the valves are typically visible through the outside of the vein. You can see them where they are. And so this would theoretically bring the valves into apposition here in the center of the vein by tightening the vein wall here. And that's called external valvuloplasty. External banding, this is a prosthetic piece, so a piece of cloth that's put around the vein. Typically it'll be either a polyester cloth or, or a Teflon material that's used to create, to, to narrow the vein at the location of the valve in hopes that the valves will coapt better and become functional. And there's some benefit to that, but it's still not a reliable alternative. And then valve transplantation. This is probably the most successful of the valve surgeries, which is where you can take a competent valve from somewhere else and put it where you need it. The typical location is to take an axillary vein valve, which is up on the top of your arm and your shoulder area, and remove that piece of vein and put it down in the leg. Now, when you do something like that in the arm, you get some arm swelling, but it's not as significant as if you took the vein in the leg. So you can, you can live without that vein, that area of vein in your arm, and it can be put down in the, in the leg in, in line with the bad vein, which has incompetence, and the valve can be used, and then you typically support it with some sort of external banding. And that has some success, but is there's only a few people that specialize this in this in the country. They're few and far between, and it has not become commonplace either. It's sort of a last resort for, for venous incompetence and chronic venous disease. And here's something that does work a bit better, which is that you can do a vein segment transfer. This is where you're just moving the blood over to the good veins. So if there's a problem with one vein you can, and you have another one in parallel next to it that has good valves, just divide the bad one and move the blood flow over to the good one. And that's what this shows. This vein was moved from an area of incompetence over onto a good vein with a valve above it so that it doesn't become high pressure. And this is the future. At some point we'll have functional implantable valves this is something that's loaded on a spring stent, and this stent could be placed through a small tube, a catheter, into an appropriate location in a vein and deployed, allowed to expand. And the idea being that this, this material, which is, appears to be a biologic material, would have a good valve function. 
So this is a, basically an a, a implantable valve that could be placed through endovascular methods. This has not really been shown to be functional yet. The problem with the vein system is that there's, uh, the blood clots form too easily on these materials. If we could put in some kind of little plastic device that would function there, that would be great. But the blood flow is so slow and it's such a, a, a high capacity vessel that it tends to accumulate blood clots and it's very difficult to keep functional for, for lowering the venous blood pressure. However, this is an active area of research and hopefully uh, in the next few years something will be available. There are more devices coming out for veins in, the, in recent months and more research is being poured into that area. And that's all.